Good afternoon and welcome to our latest webinar on hybrid working. I'm Catherine Metters and I'm going to be presenting um, some of this today um, along with my colleagues um, from Posturite. So really without further ado, I just want to give you a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you will be getting copies of the slides if you wish them um, after the uh, presentation today. And um, we're also going to have a Q&A session um, at the end. So if you would like to post any of your questions in the chat, I will uh, endeavour to answer them myself or get one of my colleagues to answer them. So let's dive on into, I suppose, hybrid working and what we're going to try and do to help you sort of get a successful implementation. So where are we? Well, I think COVID, I mean, if you look at my uh, screen here, you know, has really changed everything for us. You know, um, we've, it's really put the mix in and you know, a lot of us were already looking at different ways of working with agile working and novel working and flexible working. There were lots of things going on. Um, but COVID has really you know, enabled us, I suppose, to work through some of the barriers that were perhaps holding us back. So I think we're really in a, in a very exciting period of change. But what we want to do is try and get the best out of it for everybody. So what are the drivers for hybrid working? Well, as I've said, obviously COVID has been one of the biggest drivers for us. Um, and that's really shown us what is possible and maybe shown some of the, the difficulties we have. It's also generated quite a demand from employees. I think lifestyles have changed dramatically over the last two years and people have been very much thinking, you know, do I need to work in the same way I have in the past? And I think they're asking a lot of questions. We've also seen a lot of changing in the way that we're working and um, technology. I certainly am a, a bit of a Luddite when it comes to technology, but I found that I've really managed to embrace quite a lot of the remote working um, ways. Also having people working in different locations has given us opportunities to reduce our office working space. And of course, there are massive environmental benefits that we're all very focused on at the moment with the less commuting. Um, it really has made quite a difference. So a lot of drivers, a lot of reasons that we want to embrace hybrid working. So putting the factors, I suppose, a little bit in context, you know, the positives and negatives, you know, I don't think we can get away that in, you know, instituting hybrid is very much a cultural thing for each company. Um, we all had different working cultures before, and I think our hybrid culture is going to be very individual between employees too. I think it at the moment appears to be quite a difficult balance between um, employee desires and work requirements. I certainly have been very conscious that um, my work is, is very different from what it was two years ago. and. Um, I know there were times when I would sort of um, have to get up at five in the morning to to get to the place where I'd be training and sometimes not getting home at till 7.30 at night. And if that, I'm not saying that's the right way to work, um, but it, I wouldn't countenance that now. So I think um, there's a, a big difference between what our expectations are as employees um, and what the business um, requires going forwards. You know, we've come out of emergency measures and finding that new adjustment as to our well-being for ourselves and also the company requirements is quite difficult. We're going to have a mix of hybrid locations. Now, for many of us, that may be an office environment and a home environment, but also we're going to be going back to see maybe see some of these co-working spaces um, and mixed environments and some new ones coming forward. So that's actually going to be exciting, but there's certainly going to be a lot of shared space um, uh, work going on. And I think we need to consider that when we're looking at hybrid. We need to make sure that our employees not only are doing the right work, but now we've got an added thing. We've got the right work in the right place and at the right time. So there's a lot more variables and we're really going to have to ask our employees to, to take a lot of ownership for some of this. 
The tools for hybrid, as I said, have, have changed dramatically. Um, and one thing that I'm very uh, uh, vocal about, I suppose, is making sure that the training on all these tools is appropriate for people. We're all very diverse and we come from very different backgrounds. I didn't start using a computer. Um, until I did a did my master's degree, uh, my undergraduate, I, I I didn't touch one, um, so I am far less confident than than different different types of workers, and I need a very different way of training me to use uh, systems. So I'm really confident than somebody else, and I, I would say that we're very poor at actually making that 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 training um, flexible enough for all of our staff. And hybrid travel, I think we will see a lot less, although um, now driving, we, we, we return to traffic jams. Um, but what's important is that even though we may be traveling less, the contact that we have with the people that we need to engage with doesn't reduce. So we need to make sure that that happens. So now what are the common issues that we're all facing um, when we're considering what is hybrid working for our companies? Well, first of all, as I said, the culture, you know, we've got to define that for ourselves. And who is responsible for employees when they work in different locations? Well, ultimately, the legal requirements haven't changed. You know, we are responsible as, as employers for ensuring the, the health, safety and welfare of our employees, no matter where they're working. So we're going to have to look at our risk assessments and make sure that that's still in place. Another question I often get is who provides what equipment? That may change over time, but I think at the moment, if if we're changing working situations for individuals, um, you know, we are probably responsible for that change going forwards. But ultimately, we need to make sure that people are comfortable and are not at risk whilst they're at work. That's the fundamental thing. Specialist equipment, how do we replicate specialist equipment? Um, this is a, a question I get asked quite a lot. If people are working in two different locations, do they need the same adaptions? Well, it's not an easy question to answer because it depends what they're doing at each of the workstations. And if we're clever and we make sure that the main workstations are well set out and we have good shared workspaces, we may not need to replicate uh, adaptions at every workstation but we might, so there's a lot of variables we need to consider. We will need to relook at our, our existing office space, um, what we had pre-pandemic and what we're going to have as we've got hybrid workers will be completely different. When we talk about redesign of office, we're looking at it in a, in a way because we are looking at doing different things perhaps with the spaces that we've had. And some of my colleagues are going to talk a little bit more about that later. Management of remote workers is going to be very different from managing people face to face. And as I said earlier, a lot of people were already on that journey to look at managing people when they weren't seeing them. But this has just escalated it. And it's really important that we include everybody on this journey. It is a very complex um, process to design a hybrid working for a company and it's it's very easy because it's so complex to 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 not want to overcomplicate it but we need to make sure that we take everybody with us and that we need to make sure that every employee is given the same opportunity so really important so just to come back to what what the potential benefits and the potential drawbacks might be of, of hybrid working um, I think I'll just pull a few of those out. I think flexibility for people, um, ways of um, reducing the commute, giving people a bit more control over how they do it, but that takes responsibility too. And for me, um, with my passion for movement and looking after bodies, I think actually hybrid working is a great opportunity to get increased movement whilst we work. However, there, you know, with everything, we have to think carefully. And if we don't get it right, there are drawbacks. We could see a reduction in um, communication. Um, we could see, and we certainly did during lockdown, people working much longer hours. And you know, if their place of work is where they live, then that day could get quite long. Certainly, I am very concerned about um, poor postures. 
um, if we don't get the workstation set up correctly for the work that is done in the place, we could have people hunched over laptops and in awkward positions. I mean, certainly we saw that um, during during lockdown. And we want to make sure as we rebuild with hybrid that we make sure that good postural habits and good postures are supported. Potential IT issues. I've come into the office today because I've not been sure that my, my Wi-Fi is um, it would hold. So there are potential um, IT issues as well as loan worker issues and that management and training for individuals. Let's not forget also if we are together less, the opportunities for informal learning is reduced and, I, and I'll probably come back to that. So I was thinking designing hybrid working and I was trying to think of something that that that, it, that made sense to me. And I think it's a bit like a jigsaw. There are so many different things that we need to consider. It almost makes the the total project a little bit insurmountable. So I like to do a Christmas jigsaw. It allows me to sort of step outside at Christmas, or not step outside, but step outside the family group sometimes, and and sit there and and and, and to spend a bit of time on my own. So I was thinking hybrid is a bit like a jigsaw. And the way to do is where do you start? Well, you always start for you jigsaw people with the edge. And for me, the thing that will really ground us getting a good hybrid solution is identifying the tasks, the tasks that make our company tick, the tasks that our staff need to do to get the job done. And identifying where those are best done, I think is absolutely key to designing hybrid working correctly. So with that in mind, I came up with some steps as to you know, how to design hybrid working and it comes as no surprise after that slide. The first thing I would suggest we all do is identify the tasks and activity that require or are best achieved. And I think that's an important point. We've managed brilliantly in the last two years. Um, people have worked despite a lot of challenges. But is that the best way to, the best place to work? And I think we need to challenge ourselves on that. So I think we need to decide, you know, what activities are done best face to face um, or in collaboration with others. Um, you know, I find you know, discussion, debate, always better for me face to face. And I think for a lot of people that way. What about that informal learning? As I've said, I look back to, to when I was a, a, a young physio, actually, and I learned so much just by observing my colleagues work um, and listening to their interactions. So I would say those sorts of things are very much things that we probably need to consider for face to face activities. Maybe there are some office or site requirements. Maybe there's some equipment at sites that we need to do certain work. Um, you know, or maybe we've got a customer service role and the customers prefer or the interaction is better if we're actually with them. So that would actually identify that we need to be you know, in the office um, or at a site. On the flip side, we perhaps need to look at those activities that require, you know, uh, peace and quiet to think about maybe some complex work that um, other people in the area will be a distraction for or maybe their personal or private um, conversations one-to-ones we need to think of what activities need to be done in those sorts of areas doesn't mean to say they would necessarily have to be done in the office in a private meeting room or at home but Knowing that we need to find quiet, peaceful areas for those types of work helps us decide what locations we need and what to do with them. And then when we've looked at those various activities, we've got this one category that may be activities that actually doesn't matter where the work's carried out. You know, things like, I mean, doing email um, or telephone conversations for some people um, or just general admin tasks. So we're going to have those activities that need to be done in a collaborative area, those activities that need to be done in quiet areas, and those activities that actually it doesn't really matter. And then that starts to tell us what our hybrid is going to look like for our company and our employees. So following that sort of, um, I, I suppose it's sort of a hobnob moment, having a, a think about all the activities that go on, 
And I would also suggest in encouraging in your employees to be involved in that. What do we then need to do? Well, once we've got that information, we can start to decide what type of workspaces we need. Now, do we need lots of small quiet spaces? Do we need the opportunity for let people to work at home? Do we uh, need big collaborative spaces where people can um, exchange ideas or meeting rooms? So that will start to um, inform our decision about what we're going to need and how many we're going to need. We also need to consider, as I said, the enablement and diversity needs. So are these spaces we're designing, are they going to be accessible to all our staff and our customers? Really important that, that you know, at this design stage, we think about everybody who might be needing to us. Then we need to ask and consider the wellness of our employees. We, we now know what our, our business needs, but now what about what our employees need? You know, as I said, people have made some big life decisions over the last couple of years and people have caring needs um, and lots of other learning needs. So can we mix our requirements for our business with the desires of our employees? But actually showing our employees that we've thought clearly about what needs to be done where will allow them to see that it's not some sort of arbitrary decision we're making, but we're actually looking to rebuild our business in a hybrid way and therefore ask them to sort of work with us to get that best balance between their requirements and our business requirements. And once we have these options, we need to then look at the financials. We may have some choices. You know, we may look and say, well, we could do this or we could do this. That suits our employees. That suits the spaces. But actually, what makes the most cost effective sense? And that's got to come into it. And once we have an outline plan, we probably need to pilot and review it. So a little bit of, I suppose, practical advice, you know, We've done a lot during um, lockdown and, and different ways of working and these restrictions. So let's just stop and take a moment and have a look and see what did we do and what worked well and what didn't. And if certain things worked well for us as a business and for our employees, can we build on that? Can we expand into something similar? If we had difficulties, was there anything from that we can salvage? Were there outcomes met? And if so, can we adapt and change and see if we could do something slightly different for that? But if we are going to make new options, let's be open to, to trial and see if it works. See whether the business gets what they need and employees get what they need. And do you know what? Let's be broad shouldered and be prepared that sometimes some of the things we try aren't going to work and we need to rethink them. And I think it's all about working together to get this right. A few other sort of practical things. I think communication, we, we, we talk about it a lot. It's so important and it's really important that we set the clear expected outcomes for, for, for employees, you know, so they will know what is expected of them and they can gauge whether how they're working enables them to meet those expectations. It also means that as a business, we can um, evaluate the effectiveness of what we're doing. New procedures need to be communicated. There needs to be clear access to information for people as to how to access shared areas, how to use the technology, how they're going to be managed, how the one-to-ones are going to work. Really important that we, we communicate this very clearly and make sure that any information is clearly accessible um, for all employees. We're going to need to have an element of training for managers you know, but there's going to be a lot of way, different ways in which people are working, different processes. And so it's important our managers are trained to support the process, as well as our employees getting that information and training that I've just talked about. And hybrid is not just going to be one thing we put in place. Hybrid working is going to change as people change where they live, their locations, the technology we have, the expectations on our company. Hybrid working is going to evolve, evolve just like any other work process. So we need to make sure we have regular reviews, what is working and what is not working and ensure that we include our employees in this. So having 
done a lot of thought and talked to our colleagues. I think, you know, we at Posturite really have come up with the fact that there's going to be essentially three different types of, of hybrid workers. And we're sort of working our advice along that sort of general line. You're going to have people who perhaps, for the various factors I've talked about, are predominantly going to be in the office. Um, and we need to think how we're going to support them. They may not be there full time, but most of the time, perhaps they're going to be there. Then they're going to have people who perhaps are going to be predominantly working at home. So the majority of their working time is perhaps going to be at home, but then they're going to um, you know, come into the office or go and do other things at other times. So we need to look to see how we support them. And then you've got those people, the hybrid worker, the pure hybrid worker, as we'd call them, who is going to be using a lot of different spaces and perhaps is not going to have a set work week. And they're going to need another lot of um, care and attention to make sure that they are looked after. So a few things on the um, office space. My colleagues are going to talk a bit more about this, but it should be worth the commute. You know, if it takes two hours to get to work, there's got to be a reason as to as to why you're going to go into the office. It's got to be designed to support the activities that we've identified go on there and create movement, as I've said. Got to allow people to connect because that's quite often the main reason that people are going to be going in and allow people to develop you know, in their departments as an identity so they can work together as a team again. And it's got to be easy to use. The equipment's got to be easy and quick to set up and it's got to be flexible for all our staff. I mean, it's really important. If we make things difficult for people, they may not come and we will not get good positive outcomes. We're not going to look after their health and we're not going to be effective. Homeworking few key points here. I think we need to set some minimum standards for home working. I've certainly had lots of discussions with clients um, and there are people who don't have appropriate home working spaces for various reasons. And so we need to set some minimum standards. It's not fair that people are put at risk um, working at home. We need to look at our risk assessments and we need to have uh, risk assessments you know, for all these new places of work. We need to consider what equipment we're going to provide for home workers as, as, as a company. We need to check our security. We need to look at the practicalities of, of how we get equipment to people and how we maintain it. We need to make sure we have contingency plans, just like in the office. What happens at home if somebody's internet goes down or they've like, oh, got a, a power cut? You know, in the short term and the medium term, and that needs to be reflected in our policies and procedures. And now people are going to be working a lot more solo. We need to make sure that we give people the tools to take the ownership for that. So they look after their health and they look after their outcomes as well. And for our hybrid workers, you know, again, clear boundaries. This is something new for many people. So clear boundaries of the expectations of their work and also what they are responsible for. Good access to the, the, the procedures. We need to make sure that every role has a risk assessment so we're not missing anything. So what does a hybrid worker risk assessment look, look like? Well, it will be different for every company. We need to make sure the workstations that they visit and use are appropriate, um, whether they be longer term workstations or shared workstations. And we need to make sure they have good access to the information about how to use shared workspaces and the technology and what to do if they have problems. And as I said, it's important as people are more self-sufficient that they take some ownership um, for their health, safety and their outcomes. So we've been doing a lot of thinking about hybrid and I hope that you will find not only what I've said, but what my colleagues are going to say um, helpful in, in you. I know a lot of you are a long way down the, the route of developing your own hybrid working. But I just really want to tell you that, that we're here to support you. And I, there's a few important points here. You know, we've changed our assessments so that we will now when we do assessments, we will always ask about other places to work for individuals to make sure that they're supported in all ways. Our managed service is going to cover people working in different locations in a hybrid way. We do assessment and support of people with particular needs. As I say, inclusion is really important. 
we can help people design these new office environments for these different types of activities and different ways of working. We've expanded the uh, equipment that we can provide to support people in these different locations. And we also deliver our training either remote or face to face. And we've been doing a lot of training you know, and bespoke it for people's needs. And we also have been looking at ensuring that the air quality, particularly for things like meeting rooms, you know, will help so that we can have safe collaboration areas too. So there's a lot of hybrid going on within within Posturat, and I hope that it'll be able to support you going forwards. So that is enough from me. Um, I'm going to go over to the team now and I'm going to ask um, Dan to come on. Dan, um, would you like to um, tell us about your product recommendations? Excellent. You can. Um, so, yeah, as Catherine has just mentioned, all the signs are that hybrid working is here to stay. Um, this part of the session will look at the different user profiles that we feel most companies will adopt and also provide you with guidance and advice on the best setups for each scenario. We'll also briefly cover some products that are beneficial for the part time and full time use and good practice when using these products for hybrid working. Next slide, please, Catherine. Whilst it is a relatively new term, hybrid working has actually been around for some time. The adoption of hybrid working has been accelerated by the coronavirus pandemic and the necessity for remote working. Hybrid working may be defined as an arrangement which includes a mixture between workplace and remote working. Hybrid working will mean different things to different individuals and their organisation. When looking at the equipment for hybrid working, it will it will depend entirely on the individual and their role. When hybrid working, we will regularly see portable devices such as laptops or tablets being used by individuals. If your staff are working on the go in a number of locations or at home, would wireless options be a better solution for them when looking at input devices? Do they have a suitable bag or carry case to transport their laptop and other pieces of equipment when on the go? At Posturite, we currently recommend that staff are working from a laptop for longer periods of time and a separate mouse and keyboard should be looked at with the screen raised to an ideal height. In this situation, the top of the screen for most people need to be about eye level. Looking at laptop risers that are portable and robust if used in multiple occasions is key in this situation. Next slide, please, Catherine. Thank you. It's difficult to actually know what the hybrid office will look like moving forward. Will offices actually go back to full capacity? My colleague Paul will cover our project offering in more depth shortly. But when you are looking at bringing people back into the office, what is it they're actually coming back in for? Do they require a set workstation? Are they going to be in every day of the week? We've been speaking to a lot of clients recently that are changing how their office actually works. Staff will come in for one or two days a week, primarily for meetings and working in more communal areas. At Posturite, we recommend that within the office, staff should have an adjustable workstation, dual monitors with adjustable monitor arms, an auto weight adjust DSE chair, and a range of input to devices to use. It's all about having the best setup possible for each individual when in the office. Next slide, please, Catherine. When you're looking at your home working environment, the setup responsibility is heavily influenced by the individual and the space that they have available to them. If your member of staff is working from home the majority of the working week, we would advise that their best setup might actually need to be their home workstation. Um, your staff need to ensure that they have a large enough surface to suit the tasks that they are doing. We would suggest considering sit stand options, there are desks and platforms that we've got readily available, which we can share with you after this. We find that when people work from home full time, they might not take breaks as often as when in the office. So having the option to change their position regularly is highly recommended. Alongside a suitable workstation, DSE seating suitable for the individual, separate monitor, mouse, keyboard, 
footrest platform, maybe even a desk might be required for the individual. Next slide, please, Catherine. And of course, when, work, when home working, this all comes down to space. People working from home might not have adequate space for a permanent workstation. There are a number of cost effective solutions available at Posturite that we are able to offer for the hybrid worker, which can, we can happily share with the clients after this. The up loft and the folding away leg desk are two great options if you've got limited space at home. We've also got a number of portable lightweight solutions that we can provide, such as the Penguin mouse, the number slide keyboard or the Slim Cool laptop, Slim Cool laptop stand, which are great solutions. There are also plenty of other, other products out there, so have a chat with your local account manager after this and we'll be able to give you further advice and guidance. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, now we're moving over on to Andy, um, who's going to be talking enablement for us. So, um, Andy, over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, yeah, afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Andy Rigby, um, the regional manager for the north of England and one of the enablement leads here at Posturite, which is our disability assessment and solution division. Um, this is perhaps one of the more difficult ones to get right from a hybrid working point of view. But before going into this in, in, a, in a bit of detail, I uh, just wanted to have a look at some of the issues within the cases we've been dealing with over the last few months and, and the assessments we've been doing. So next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so this is a small snapshot of assessments and issues that we have assessed for. There's certainly um, a lot more on that list on the right hand side that we have been dealing with over the last 18 months, two years. Um, we've actually seen um, um, the, the need for um, assessments grow since hybrid working has been, been implemented. So um, for disabled and neurodivergent employees, the need for flexible working is, is significantly growing and has been all, all, over the, quite a, a number of years. So we've seen in the past that many people have wanted to work from home, but, but may have been denied for whatever reason. Uh, and, and as Catherine mentioned, COVID has obviously been a, a big catalyst for a lot of individuals where it essentially happened overnight. Um, but outside workers that have not been assessed or do not have the right adjustments may struggle with this. And, and that's where we've been helping. Um, you can see from the list of some examples of the kind of assessments and cases we've recently been dealing with and had a huge increase. Um, it may be a small change, such as as someone with a hearing impairment doing conference calls online on the home days because it's easier um, using Teams, calls with colleagues facing the camera as, as I am now, lip reading, using text boxes, etc. than maybe being in a big busy meeting room. It may be individuals who, who suffer uh, fatigue due to long COVID, which is something that we're having a lot of discussions about. Um, so they may need to just do half a day in, in the office and work the rest of the day at home and have breaks throughout the day. Um, it may be colleagues um, do follow a similar working pattern to the rest of the team. However, they need assistive technology for literacy, voice activation, whatever that may be, but it needs to be uh, at more than one workstation to perform the key tasks all week. If an individual is working in a hybrid way, then there cannot be an assumption that their needs only matter at one of those workstations. That's a sort of key part. So everyone will work in a different way in the office to those at home, more so with a neurodiverse condition or a disability, who will have to find coping strategies to perform certain tasks and situations. So we've seen a lot of assessments where the outlook is completely different in the home environment to the office environment. Perfect example of this is a client recently told me that someone in the office who had dyslexia had colleagues within the office that helped him with certain tasks. And it may just be a couple of questions, checking a, uh, checking a couple of things. Um, his colleagues were more than happy with, with this arrangement. So that's that was his coping strategy. But what does that person do when he's working home alone and suddenly has no one to ask for assistance? So there's an assumption that he's fine because he coped fine in the office, but he may be really struggling at home and need assistance and tasks may start to take significantly longer. So a hybrid working, um, whilst hybrid working may remove workplace barriers for some disabled people, it can easily create new barriers if the process hasn't been well thought through and doesn't take an individualised approach. And if not done correctly, can have knock on effects around morale, mental health and the ability to do their job. Therefore, this is key to get this right now and, and not let time have a negative impact on an individual. Next slide, please, Catherine. So the key message here is that 
there's no one size fits all approach. So to put some context in place here are some of the basic statistics about the number of individuals who are dealing with disabilities or or conditions currently. And this is a very generalized um, uh, list of stats. But if you relate them to your own workforces in terms of percentages to gauge the scale of people that may need assistance or small changes. According to scope, 19% of the adult age workforce are classed as disabled, so everyone has individuals that need to be asked this question. This is about the individual, their ability, their job role and, and clear communication both ways. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So communication is key and, um, and, and that's the individual. It, it, it'll be the individual's line manager, which is so important to get engagement there. Uh, and any staff that are around that individual. So this may be an awareness issue as well. To help individuals, I'd recommend that there are clear signposting routes for them to know where to go if they need to speak up about what hybrid working means for them. Inclusion surveys has been, a, uh, I've had a lot of discussions around inclusion surveys, a great way to implement this. And many clients are doing uh, just this or, or something similar to gauge some information. Um, individuals need to know where to go if they need further assistance and for, and, and for me this is key to the whole process. Training uh, and or reasonable adjustments may be needed for hybrid working. What works in the office either needs to be replicated at home or adjusted so it works just as well. Next slide please Catherine. So in, in a lot of these cases um, obviously quick turnarounds are, are, are potentially key. Um, so this is just an example of our turnaround times in terms of referral, assessment, report, and any implementations, training for the individual. Um, it, it's a start to finish process in potentially two to three weeks. So it's a fast turnaround to allow the individual to, to, to essentially do their job. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So ultimately, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, this is about the individual being able to do the job to the best of their ability, regardless of working location. They need to be equipped, included uh, and able to perform the tasks that they are required to do. So it can be very, very small changes. It can be a seven pound screen filter just 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 to help an individual. It can be an agenda being sent out a day earlier. It can be a keyboard shortcut changing the speed of a mouse, but it can make a big difference. And asking the question to that is absolute key. Um, there's yeah, a lot to think about and, and pack into five or six minutes. But if anybody needs any further guidance, on any of this or wants to have a specific conversation around assessments, process, training, equipment, then please get in touch. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Andy. OK, moving on to training consultancy, something close to my heart. Um, John. Yep. Hi there, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, and hello to everybody. I was just going to spend the next few minutes um, updating you really on how our training and consultancy division has been transitioning and the services that we're looking to support our clients with as we sort of dive move through this sort of hybrid working environment that we find ourselves in. Um, so next slide for us, please, Catherine. So I think oh, I thought we would kick off really with the probably the most common question that we get asked from a training division, which is, you know, with our people back in the office only about 50% of the time, how many people are now needed for these key roles? So what we've found is that this is a new environment for us. And I think if we um, can scoot through the bullet points here, Catherine, but um, it's a new working in, in environment that we all find ourselves in. And whilst the legislation has remained um, throughout for training, really what we're looking for, I think, is, is new legislation or modified legislation to give us some guidance. And we also understand that actually something like training is something that potentially was put on the back burner um, with everybody working at home and having empty offices. But what we're finding now is that the time is now and the time is to act now as we return to the office. And the problem that our clients seem to be having is that whilst they're meeting the legislation for the amount of people that they have qualified for their training needs, actually when people return to those offices, perhaps those people aren't in the office at the appropriate time. So perhaps you fall short on things like first aiders or, or fire wardens. So as a result, this is the question that we seem to be getting asked quite frequently. Now, Whilst we don't have any um, strict guidance around this as such, what we want really are working towards is that more is better. Um, and as a rough rule of thumb, what we're looking at is that if we are having people in the office 50% of the time, perhaps we need double the amount of people trained in some of these key roles. Now, 
This might not necessarily mean that they have to be trained to the full extent. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide in ways that we're looking to provide different training services in order for you to be able to get a higher volume of people to cover some of these key roles. Next slide, please, Catherine. So really at Posturite, we look to specialise in four key areas of training, um, and that's DSE, first aid, fire warden and manual handling. Um, and we also do provide lots of bespoke training for our clients as well. And I think one of the biggest changes for us is like yourselves, overnight things changed for us as a division when suddenly we couldn't train face to face anymore and we had to transition and we moved all of our training into a, a virtual remote setting. Um, but what we're really excited about as we now transition back towards this hybrid model and the, and the future ways of working is that we're really looking forward to be able to offer both services. We, we found the virtual service to be um, incredibly successful for us and actually became quickly aware of the advantages that it provided to our clients. But also, we believe passionately in the importance of our face to face training as well. So as a division, as we move towards some of these challenges put forward to, by hybrid working, what we're looking to do is be able to help you to train your employees in the way that works for you as an organisation. So for all of our training, we, we can offer those in a face to face or a remote setting or some of our training can be blended as well. We also, as I mentioned, offer some smaller courses as well. So if we take something like first aid and you're looking to grow the volume of first aiders that you have, it might be that you don't want to double the amount of fully first aid at work qualified people you have, but you're looking perhaps to get more emergency first aiders. Or one of our popular courses throughout this pandemic has been our DSE awareness course. So whilst it might not go into the detail of our full day course um, in, in terms of DSE training, what it does is provide an awareness for you to have extra employees within the organisation that can give DSE guidance um, to support the, the amount of people working perhaps in isolation or, or, or in a hybrid way. Next slide for us please Catherine. And what I wanted to do just to conclude was talk about some of the services that um, we are things that we've always done, but become increasingly popular, particularly in the last month or so. Um, and one of the key things that our clients seem to be uh, taking a lot of benefit from at the moment is what we term our walk around service. Now, we know right now. For all of us, what we're experiencing is probably the biggest change in the working environment that any of us have ever experienced. And we also know that people do struggle with change. I think some people really embrace change. Some people perhaps don't like change. But I think for all of us, change can pose some problems. So what we found to be very beneficial for our clients is to provide a assessor or a physiotherapist on site on their offices um, as, as their clients and their employees return to work. And what this allows us to do is to be able to go around and give really informal, um, individualised advice to people to really help them to go through this period of change. People understandably may have some reluctance in returning to the office. They may have developed some pains and problems associated with working at home. But in this return to office, what we're looking to do is make that as smooth as possible for our clients. And this walk around service allows you to use one of our assessors or high level physiotherapists in order to go around and give that guidance. We can document um, things that we're talking about and we're discussing with employees um, in order to provide you a record. But really, it's just to support people in that comfortable transition back into this new hybrid way of working. Um, and the next slide, please. And another very popular service at the moment is what we term our bespoke webinar service. And again, I suppose with our walk around service being how we're supporting people in a face to face manner, here's how we're supporting people remotely. So really trying to cover all aspects of the new working world that we find ourselves in. And what we look to do here is really to deliver the message that our clients want to be delivered to their employees using some of our expertise. So one of the most popular ones that we seem to be doing at the moment is around how you can be working from home comfortably and more ergonomically. And this may be utilising items or equipment that you already have in the home, but perhaps giving across the message that it's a vital time, as Catherine men mentioned earlier, for us to take some self-understanding, some self-awareness in order to create the best working environment for ourselves. So 
What we are looking to do is we just deliver these messages via uh, Microsoft Teams as we're delivering this message to you now, or Zoom or one of these digital platforms. And it allows people to join and informally be trained to conduct some Q&A sessions with the experts delivering the training. And also one of the other advantages that our clients have benefited from is being able to then have a recording of that. And that's something that they can then utilize um, when they're looking to re-deliver this message or deliver the message to people who weren't unable to attend live. So I think ultimately to conclude within the training and consultancy division, what we're looking to do is support you in the ways that you need. We fully appreciate and see that everybody's needs may be slightly different and we're all at different stages in understanding what the future is going to look like. But what we are looking to do is make sure that we have the services that we can deliver to you to support your company message and really in the way that you want it to be delivered to your employees. Um, if you do have any um, inquiries, anything that you'd like to reach out to us about, um, please do feel free to drop us a line at training at posturite.co.uk. Um, or if you have any questions, feel free to drop those into the chat and then there'll be some time at the end for us to cover those questions. I think that's all from me. And thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Right, moving on uh, swiftly to uh, managed service and hybrid working. Matt, can I hand over to you? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to um, spend the next five minutes or so um, this section of the webinar just running through and discussing how our managed service offering is and can help clients with with hybrid working. So um, yeah, next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so at Posture Riot, we now have a team of fully employed uh, case managers who are all trained DSE assessors, but also now have a wealth of experience in managing workstation assessment processes and systems on behalf of our clients so what managed service is is a um, it, it provides our clients with the ability to outsource the management of the, their workstation assessment process um, to our, our, our fully trained team um, so we're particularly now getting involved with support around hybrid working as we've spoken about today and which is obviously fairly obvious as clients start to develop and implement their policies and procedures around uh, managing workstation assessments within their businesses now this can be utilizing work right or, or other online systems or even just supporting the development and rollout of uh, existing in-house systems and our implementation team can guide you through the options of effectively building your assessments now for hybrid working and then what we do is create a bespoke workflow to help um, you manage and support the rollouts to your to your employees and what we really try to do is in, sort of embed ourselves in your processes and look to become an extension of your team so whether that's managing cases on a single call but looking to cover all the working environments that employees might be working in or setting up multiple calls for each environment we just our, our main aim is to deliver the, the messaging that that um that you're looking to to deliver to your um to your staff um and then there are various strategies that um your business will look to implement with and that they look to implement that we can try and um uh, work around now that might be as uh, simple and basic as providing basic guidance and advice on maximizing existing setups where possible it might need to be escalating or referring staff into facilities or oh or hr or even into one of our own specialist assessment or disability type services right through to supporting and providing guidance on any equipment requirements so whether that's specialist uh, furniture for staff returning to the office it might be just basic homework or furniture for employees homes or suitable solutions for staff working on the go or in touchdown areas just so that um, everybody's working towards the, the, the standards that, that your businesses are setting uh, next slide please Catherine um, so we really feel that our managed service is quite uniquely positioned because we can provide uh, a really valuable resource for you, um, which is essentially time. Um, so, you know, your time is valuable and, and we feel like the service that we provide uh, allows uh, you to, to use that time more effectively. And we do that by managing the volume of the tasks that, that a new hybrid workstation assessment process is going to create. But equally, we have that very specialist expertise to help individual staff members who are having issues with their workstations um, that can include knowledge on how best to set up their existing equipment discussing any specific msks equipment challenges or disabilities that they might have right through to implementing relevant actions and recommendations whether that's off the back of one of our um, triage calls or whether that's guidance and advice that you that that, that you'd like us to deliver on your behalf um, and we do that essentially through two key tasks the first is case our case management services which is 
a holistic approach to sort of picking up cases on your behalf um, and then deciding the best course of action based on the agreed workflows that we put in place for you and implementing the agreed strategies. And then the next key service that we offer is, is our triage call service, which is essentially a short remote video call to discuss and manage the issues raised with employees and then the effective implementation of any improvements and recommendations that we can make. Now, as we've already as I've already said, that might include managing issues across multiple environments. Um, it can be providing general advice and guidance on optimal positioning and, and working practices. It can be escalations back into your business to, to resolve issues. We can work with approved product lists. We can even go as far as ordering or even ma just managing orders on your behalf, which would generally be via an approval process. And then there's an all important follow up service to ensure that any um, actions or recommendations that we make um, are working well for, for the employee. And then around those two sort of core services, there are also the general support tasks that we can action on your behalf. So in the very initial stages of implementing um, you know, your hybrid workstation assessment policies and procedures, we can provide guidance and um, advice on, you know, based on our experience so far in, in helping other clients put this together um, with our expertise. There's general advice on um, implementation and strategies that we can help you with. We can even go as far as managing sort of general inquiries that you might get into a health and safety inbox and also other health and safety tasks. So touching on, on John's session there, you know, we are helping other clients manage the number of first aiders and fire wardens they have and engaging training um, if those need if those need to be increased. Um, we're able to provide regular reporting on the progress that we're we're making um, for you and then there's user management which generally involves keeping systems up to date so that you're confident and and aware that all staff are keeping up to date with their training and assessments and, and hopefully driving compliance within your business next slide please Catherine um, and then uh, just to finish really we um, we provide lots of MI and reporting. Again, a lot of this is agreed to implementation, but we track how much time we spend on, on, on any contracts that we're working on. We've got quite a precise time tracking software tool, which we'll share with you at regu regular interviews just to make sure that you're, you know, you're completely aware of what tasks we're undertaking and how long they're taking for you. Um, uh, to show that we're, be, we're being effective. So, so yeah, just to conclude, really, Managed Service provides a really flexible, bespoke resource to help manage any new or ongoing hybrid workstation assessment rollouts that you're you're planning or or are implementing um, using our, our in-house team of experts, um, which we're calling case managers. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Moving on to furniture projects, I've got uh, Scott and uh, Paul. Scott, I believe you're you're speaking first, so um, uh, away you go. think you might be on mute, Scott. Can you hear me now? I can indeed. OK, great. No, thanks for sticking around, everyone. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Um, I'm conscious that this might go a little bit in terms of what Catherine's uh, already mentioned in the beginning slide, so I'll, I'll move over this as quickly as we can. Uh, next slide, Catherine. So yeah, um, current challenges when it comes to the office space. Um, first and foremost, in true posture right fashion, it, it's what do our staff need? What tasks are they carrying out in that area? What benefits can the office environment provide that uh, perhaps the, the home or, or hybrid space can't? And by hybrid space, I mean on the go, like coffee shops or hotel receptions or wherever people want to work. Um, and what function do we need the space to fulfill? Uh, it's, it's almost certainly been redefined by hybrids. Um, so do we, it, it's certainly cheaper for the organization to have individuals perform DSE tasks at home. So what are they coming into the office for? Is it viewed that maybe that's uh, an area for us to become more collaborative? Um, is there um, less of a need for, for bank desking as such? Um, what do we, what are we, what are we trying to get out of that space? Um, within that then, what, equipment do we need in that space if it's more collaborative do we get rid of some of those desks do we maybe fill it with some more collaboration or idea areas maybe some high tables circular that people can sit around and have a conversation um is there perhaps a need for some more soundproofing because we're expecting more conversations to happen um is there perhaps a need for um, air purification which uh, without treading on leon's toes too much coming up um maybe we're we're asking people to gather in smaller areas so that they can communicate um 
what spa space do we need in terms of square footage? Um, now that probably is a conversation that's more pressing than most in terms of people trying to establish exactly how many desks they're going to need. If so, do they still need as many offices or as many floors within a building as they did before? And that will be based on on time frames and, and obviously we'll have commitment moving forward. So it's uh, potentially one of the questions that, that adds to the kind of the urgency as to resolving the situation and really reviewing our hybrid plans. Um, and ultimately, how much will all this cost? So then when it comes to the future of office space, it, it does offer different benefits to the, the home or on the go. Um, it has the potential to be a very collaborative area uh, where individuals come to share ideas, as Catherine was mentioning before, if we're looking to debate or, or collaborate with individuals to to really make groundbreaking decisions in terms of where the business is going or, or maybe additional services that we're bringing on board, then th there is really no better than, than getting in contact with each other face to face. Um, as a result of that, do we perhaps have reduced capacity because we've freed up some of the, the floor plan um, that was traditionally taken up with DSC workstations to, uh, to what's the word, um, to, to, yeah, so to support that new way of working. Um, those uh, workstations, I, although this was primarily came in way before COVID, but uh, hybrid, uh, sorry, hot desking areas kind of became the norm. And I think an awful lot of space um, is now multi-user. And as such, perhaps the capabilities of the equipment within that space needs to change slightly as well. Um, but the office really can be a connection point, uh, not only to, to the brand and to company principles, but also to the colleagues. Um, and what that does is the, the way that that office is designed um, can really have a massive impact on the way that individuals who work for that business view it and view the direction that it's going and also view how, uh, how to maximize their own time um, whilst being an employee of that organization. But so it should really be a place that staff want to visit. But with that, it has to be worth it. Those visits to the office do cost more. Um, there's increased effort, increased time, increased time away from the workstation perhaps, um, and it has an environmental impact as well. So for the times that the office is the right place to do that task, we should really encourage staff to utilize the space available. Um, but in order for that to work, thought needs to go into what that space needs to be. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So in terms of how we're helping, um, I mean, there's a, there's a huge number of things we could discuss here. Um, we have noticed uh, an awful lot of, of projects recently in terms of people having reviewed their space now know what they need it to do uh, and how they would like it to function. Um, within that, first of all, visibility on products, uh, chair audits in particular, a number of organizations send chairs home. Uh, they don't really know, they may not know what's left in the office, what condition it's in, whether there's a reason that they're the chairs that were left over. Um, so what we can do is run through uh, an audit where we apply a green, amber, red rating to that those uh, pieces of equipment and uh, give you status updates in terms of exactly what you've got. Uh, and if so, it allows you to refocus your resources. There's no point in replacing chairs that are green or that may just require a simple um, amendment or, or fix. However, we can focus our resources towards those red chairs that are, are broken and perhaps should be taken out of circulation. Um, with that in mind, uh, multi-user DSE restock, we've had a number of chairs, desks, monitor arms, so on and so forth, go out of the building uh, or go out the, of the buildings and we need to replace those so we can absolutely help with that. Um, review and restock of specialist chair graveyards. This has come up quite a lot. Sorry if you're offended by the use of the term graveyards, but um, there's a number of reasonable adjustment chairs that um, have been pushed off to one side and before individuals really come back and start utilizing them again, it's a case of reviewing those. Are they still fit for purpose? Are the individuals that those chairs were originally recommended for still with the business or have they simply been circulated throughout? Um, is there perhaps a, a new um, decent standard of chair that we can use in place as like a stopgap remedial chair um, if required so that people who are touching down for a day, two days can be suitably supported, trained to do so, um, but also uh, without the need to have to sit on standard chairs that may not be suitable for their requirements or adjustable enough for their requirements. Um, very much encouraging uh, clients to go down the route of ethical disposal for uh, redundant equipment. There are a number of different options, either in the form of repurposing through charities that we work closely with, um, where 
uh, equipment is is used in in projects uh, to set up DSC workstations stations either um, uh, domestically or overseas. Um, and I think really key the, the expert guidance that goes along with product specification. Um, the the traditional view of what offices were. Um, there's been an awful lot of change and with that there are functions within different pieces of equipment that can really provide additional value not only in terms of how they function but in terms of return of investment moving forward um, and one thing that we pride ourselves on is po at Posturite is we are very much finger on the pulse of all the things that are available on the markets and we're independent um, so we have access to essentially everything so you can consider it's almost like a compare the market as uh, obviously other uh, comparison websites are available, but you can c consider us a comparison of, of all the uh, different options that are out there. And then moving on to the next part with my, my colleague, Paul, who will speak in a second, it's the review, sorry, the review, the redesign and the repurposing of this existing office space. Is it appropriate for the new functions? Is it conducive to a collaborative work environment? Uh, and again, is it a place where staff really want to come and maximize the benefits of? Okay, that, that's it from me. I'll pass you on to my colleague, Paul. Thank you, Thanks. Scott. On to Paul. There you go. Sorry, yeah, jumping in there quickly. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, obviously, uh, we all anticipated the pandemic would not as last as long as it did. And we all went home and we took chairs from the office and different items. And we anticipated we'd be back within three to six months. Obviously, almost two years on, that's not happened. And businesses have realised that productivity can still be achieved uh, by people working at home and managing their staff in a slightly different way, uh, that they don't really require the same uh, level of estate or buildings they have. Uh, one of my areas of expertise is working within government, and um, the UK government are reducing a lot of their uh, building um, estate uh, literally below 30% of what they already have. Uh, because again, they're achieving productivity and they don't need to bring people back to work. What they do have is 80% uh, of their staff don't want to come back to work because they enjoy working from home, they don't like to commute, uh, and they're, they've got more flexible working. So, but they do want to encourage their staff to come back, and this is where we get into uh, what the new office should look like and how that space that they do have. Uh, we should do so we're looking at you know the furniture that is still left on site how we can audit that and reconfigure that furniture into the new space or can we then use that furniture to support the home workers allowing for their space at home uh, it's also uh, about technology you know we all use wi-fi we all go to the local costa coffee and other coffee houses uh, to work and be comfortable it's obviously how that space is going to be uh, used wi-fi is general but everybody needs power so how do you power the, the variety of products uh, the different laptops, tablets, uh, using USB charging, A and C. You know, how do we build those into the sofas, into the tables and desking, uh, but also make that space more attractive to encourage uh, colleagues to come back every so often to work in that space and interact with their colleagues. We all call it collaborative space. Um, we say in the main area going forward, but it's about, you know, collaborative working, uh, the products that are put forward that will meet 95% of the percentile staff uh, that are dropping in for an hour or a whole day. Um, we, we look on their smaller office space is uh, due to home working that is going to go forward and commercial clients as well are going that way as well. Um, Furniture standards are going to change because, uh, as we know, the standards for office use in fabrics and other materials are not the same for home workers. So you have to be aware that any products that you are providing uh, to home workers, they really do need to meet domestic requirements as well in fire testing and those areas. Next slide, please. Catherine. 
Um, so what we do, and we offer a service, you know, is all about space planning and design. Uh, this is a project where with a client um, where they had, you know, multiple desking in clusters of six to four. Um, and they asked me to come up with a design to just show um, collaborative working to allow those you know, circular tables that one person or three can work together or just literally three people can work separately, but at the same station. Those tables will have power to support everybody that's working there, but obviously have Wi-Fi. Uh, everybody's realized that meeting rooms are really just large telephone booths for one person. Um, so they're coming up with what they call uh, parachuting in meeting booths that people can sit within those areas to work. There'll be a TV to present to uh, some colleagues or visitors, um, or I've even had lunch. Um, but it's really just making it more attractive um, to bring people back into their workspace and also more attractive to visitors into your building. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, a service we offer, you sold it, the, the 2D design. We do 3D because technology has moved on dramatically. Uh, and it gives you a visual of what that space to look like. The image you're seeing now, you've got the circular table, you've got the meeting booth. You also see the high bench table. Um, studies have proven, especially for UK, it's a culture thing, that uh, if you if, a, if you're in the UK and you go into a restaurant with two of you and you sit at a, day, a table of four, um, someone else comes in, they will not sit with you. But if you're in Italy, France or Germany, they will go into us and they will sit next to you with no qualms whatsoever. So it's been proven if you sit at a high table, you will sit with strangers and you still might start to communicate, but you actually will sit there. So it's more comfortable. Again, having power and data uh, flow through the area. Thank you, Catherine. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see the way it's going is being more attractive. It's actually going very much more domesticated um, in the design of furniture. The fabrics are obviously commercial, uh, but it's to be more comfortable. Each of these units you see on the slide will come with power units. Um, so you can you know, plug and charge your laptop or tablets, but it really makes it more attractive to come in uh, and work in that space. And also it allows you to have great meetings because obviously, although everybody's not working in the office, you still may need to bring your team uh, together, your occupational health team, to bring them together, to discuss new ways of working. And these areas can be uh, utilized in that way, uh, but then also can be used from other staff areas. So it's really having more flexible areas and flexible furniture uh, supporting new technology, but also I know we keep using the uh, new way of working. Um, next slide, please, Kevin. So as what products do we need? So, you know, we talked about home working. Not everybody has the space at home or a spare bedroom to set up their office. So, you know, we've had examples where people are using ironing boards as their desk. Uh, so where they've gone home. So we've developed products for home workers uh, in apartments or in houses or small homes, um, so they don't have to use the ironing board, uh, but also so they're comfortable and ergonomically correct so they can work uh, you know, correctly in their home. Uh, Obviously, with the pandemic, we weren't allowed to go into homes to install. So uh, we developed a, a very simple folding leg desk uh, that could be installed by the home user. Uh, and it's very easy to move from one home to another back to the office. And again, you see um, more flexible working areas. What is occurring, especially within government, because they're reducing their estate, is they're changing their desking uh, Postura just won an order for 2,000 state workstations, uh, um, height adjustable desk uh, to change it for what they have on site already, due to the fact that they want, instead of 2,000 staff using that space, they want 7,000, and it will work with all users, whether they're wheelchair, 
six foot seven or five foot nothing it will work with them so they can high adjust it and use that space it will be a bookable space um but it that that now space will work with majority of staff they're all there. um so that goes on there obviously also um storage the pedestals are disappearing in offices, so they're having what they call communal locker areas where anybody coming in, almost like a sports club or whatever, where they're coming in for the day, they will be given access to a locker so they can store their personal equipment for that day, which they will have to remove. Uh, but it does away with storage in pedestals and everything, but it gives them that again flexibility on each floor plate or each area. Thanks, Catherine. Next slide, please. Uh, you see on the uh, the image on the left, this is really for team meetings. Uh, so you can gather, but you can, you know, if you have a large group, you can have a majority sitting down, but the height of the back of the chairs allows you to stand around. Uh, so you can bring them together and they can have interaction and collaboration. Um, but once that meeting's done, individuals can use that space or visitors can use that space as well. Uh, we do put power generally into the soft seating rather than a tabletop and that works down. Left image is again domesticated, but it's again using and attracting more people to come back into the office, uh, but to use it comfortably. One thing we do encourage is they, you know, all employers is to make sure their staff understand they do have the permission to sit at a sofa to work when they're in the office as long as they're working. Next slide please Cameron. Um, we talked about meeting booths, we talked about study areas, power, you can see all the different um, suggestions we have. We can provide these, we manufacture some, but as Scott said, we do have uh, a network of suppliers around the country and we work with all major manufacturers in the UK and Europe uh, and we can provide solutions um, that will cover all areas. And this image that uh, Catherine just put up, you can see how we've designed, you know, different areas within a, a simple floor plate. Uh, the chairs on the left hand side is uh, again, as Scott said, if you're coming in for an hour to a day, do you require a true ergonomic chair or do you require a work chair that gives you some movement, but you're going to be gone within the hour, two hours? That's what we're now working to, to provide working ch work chairs as well as ergonomic chairs. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, you can see by our space planning, uh, this is the, what a, a common office would look like. Uh, we can take your drawings um, and we can use them by DWG or CAD uh, technology is we can space plan this for you. We can give you a 3D image um, and we can create this in collaboration with all clients to create the right space uh, within the floor plate that they, they need that to happen. Next slide, please. I think that's you done, Paul, so, actually. So yes. that's it. So it's all ready for us to finish on is uh, over the last few years, working with the government and with commercial clients, you know, you can redesign the space with new furniture that will support your staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Leon is going to be talking to us about air quality. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Um, over the last 18 months, improving indoor air quality has become a hot topic of conversation in most of our meetings particularly in relation to people feeling confident about returning to the office. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about how we can support you with improving your indoor air quality. The Aeromax is available in both a domestic and a commercial range. The Aeromax Pro, which is the commercial range of the product, it works independently, but doesn't affect the performance of your existing ventilation and air conditioning systems to remove any airborne germs, viruses, dust, uh, odours, VOCs uh, and, and other bacteria as well. Next slide please Catherine. So I imagine most of you will be working towards a total hygiene solution. So you'll be encouraging your staff to wash their hands regularly, you'll be sanitising surfaces, 
The Aramax covers cleaning the air element of your office environments. Next slide, please, Catherine. The product uses a, a four stage filtration process. So you've got the, the pre filter, which captures large particles. The carbon element gets rid of any odors and VOCs. You've got a HEPA filter, which deals with the smaller particles. And this all coupled with the bipolar ionizer works to increase the efficiency of each of those filters. And it's important to mention that the bipolar ionizer can be switched off as well if needs be. Next slide, please, Catherine. So to prove the effectiveness of the machines, we had them independently tested using some airborne uh, strains of the H1N1 virus, uh, human coronavirus strain 229E, and of late COVID-19. Now, the products demonstrated that they removed 99.9% .9 of the, the viruses from the air, and the test methodology that we used and or, or that was used rather, and the certification is available. Next slide, please, Catherine. The patented EnviroSmart technology, which is built into each of the machines, automatically detects poor air quality. What that will do in turn then is adjust the fan speed accordingly to deal with the airborne threat. You've got five different fan speeds and you've even got a quiet mode where noise might be a concern. Now that coupled with the PureView screen, which is available on certain models, gives a digital display of the percentage of air particles that are being captured in real time. So it gives the room occupants that peace of mind that the air they're breathing is clean. And on to my last slide, please. The product is available in three different models. So you've got the Aramax Pro 2, which is the smallest model, the Aramax Pro 3 and the Aramax Pro 4, which is the largest model. The Aramax Pro 2 will cover up to 25 square metres, the 3 up to 55 and the 4 up to 110 square metres. Now that's going to give you between three to five air changes per hour. So every 12 to 20 minutes, you're going to get a complete air change of that room. Each of the models are available in a wall mounted version or on a stand, which means that the product can be made portable. So it's ideal for meeting rooms or wherever you may need to move it around the office. Now, if the product's of interest, we can support you uh, either remotely through Teams meetings or coming on site to actually measure up and give you an idea of, of which models may be most suitable and where to locate the products throughout your offices. In the first instance, we would request floor plans or dimensions of the space that you're considering to implement the product. So I hope this shows that Aramax is an effective and a flexible solution to help improve your in indoor air quality in relation to hybrid working and a safe return to the office. That's it for me. Thank you, Leon. Cheers. Right, so that's all of our speakers. Thank you, um, everybody, for, for, for bearing with us. I'm now going to have a look at the chat and see what questions we've had, and either I will answer them or I will form them out to, to my colleagues. So if you could just bear with me. Um, we had a question to begin with um, talking about um, auto weight adjust for office chairs rather than a chair with a manual tension. I think very much um, we're all aware that um, chair adjustment is often very poorly done by a lot of people. People come into the office and they sit down. And I think there is definitely a move towards trying to make as many adjustments automatic as possible so the individual um, doesn't have to adjust it. It's not going to suit everybody, but I think for sort of as a, as a standard chair to have it as, a, as an auto tension seems to be something that um, is, is very beneficial for, for many multi-user in, environments. So um, I, we, we can certainly talk about that 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 further, uh, Juliet, I think in, in, in the future. Um, but that's sort of the reason why we're, we're tending towards a, an auto, um, auto um, adjust. Um, Right, we have a question here, which I think Andy, you might um, want to, to jump in on. Um, what sort of questions would be part of an inclusion survey? And could those questions be added to a more general survey? I don't know if you're able to, to help Andrea with that. Um, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question. It, it, it's probably put it back on the, on the individual that's asked the question really as to what, what kind of outcome you'd want from that. There's 
There's plenty of um, templates online in terms of inclusion and diversity surveys, and it may be sort of generalised questions around uh, asking individuals do they feel, uh, you know, that they're in a supportive environment and ask very sort of general questions, or it can be as, as sort of specific to to um, to say, you know, are there any parts of your job role where you feel that you need additional support? Um, so yeah, probably it can be it can be very sort of generalised, or it can be very specific in terms of what you what what you want the outcome to be. Um, it, it obviously can be part of a of a more general um, a, a general survey. Um, but yeah, there are a lot a lot of things online. It probably just depends on on how uh, how specific you want to be. Um, you know, I know I know I spoke to a client uh, last week that that even uh, just included how you know for, for the individual to answer have you. Have you been uh, diagnosed with 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 a neurodivergent um, condition, or, or do you feel that you you have one, or something along those lines, where actually they could get a a, a list of people that they just need to go and, and and investigate a little bit further with, and and see what support they need. So, um, yeah, um, it it can be yeah quite a quite a vague um, or, or sort of general survey, or, or quite a specific one. It's uh, but yeah, there's there's plenty of things online uh, for for a lot of organisations that specialise in that. If um if 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 um would we be able to signpost people to some of those yeah. um things? So if they wanted to get in touch with you, you'd be able to perhaps sign the yeah, person to some resources. Yeah. yeah. That that'd be great. Thanks, Andy. Um so question about um funding of equipment where the person is um is asking for hybrid as part of a, uh, a lifestyle choice. I think this is a quite a complex area. Um, I mean, certainly we have to remember the employer is responsible for the health and safety. Um, I think there is always negotiation. If the, the, the activities can be carried out in both places, um, I think we well, obviously need to check with HR, but I think if people, as long as we check that the environment is suitable, if they are saying, I'd rather not come in the office, I can work as effectively and we are happy as far as businesses is case, but you know, that they we might be able to they might be able to fund it themselves. But I think it does depend a little bit on the contract. And I think it also is important that it is the activities that person is doing fall into that category it can be done in either place. And it is, as you say, a choice, but we have to make sure that what whatever and whoever provides the equipment um that the uh, the area is safe bit of a long-winded um, answer there chris I, I hope that helps you can always uh, reach out and, and, and we can chat it through a bit more um so richard i'm just looking at your question here um are there any pitfalls about asking staff to purchase their own desks and chairs and screens I've probably got some of my account managers sort of jumping to leap in on this one, but I think actually I, I, I'll take this one. Um, I've certainly seen uh, situations where uh, companies have provided funds and told people to go and get their own equipment um, without giving them any guidance. And often people have purchased equipment that either isn't fit for purpose um, or isn't fit for the you know, longevity, so it breaks quite quickly. So we've seen that there has been, I suppose, a, a fair amount of waste on equipment. So I think it's important to provide guidance to employees if you are going to allow them to buy their own equipment as to what the um, the standard of equipment and what the functionality of the equipment that you would expect them to buy. I think that way you could probably get that balance between finding something that fitted in with their home, but also ensuring that it was fit for purpose. So. I hope that helps a bit, Richard, on that. But certainly, there have been situations where resources have, I think, been poorly used. Um, Andrea is asking about whether we can create um, help create hybrid working policies. Um, yes, yes, we can, and I'm hoping that next week um, I've been working on a an example hybrid working policy that I hope people might find useful, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to send that out to the people who've been on this this call today, and it might uh, at least starts you off in the direction of, um, of of writing a hybrid policy. So I hope that might be helpful. Um, um, Tracy asked about the air quality products. Um, Tracy, I hope that Leon's um, presentation was able to uh, provide you with the answers that you needed. Um, if not, please feel free just to, to contact um, uh, Leon and I'm sure he'll be able to answer your questions on that one. Um, Cost will come into it 
yes, I think, Joe, you're right. Um, cost is always going to be, it's always important that um, once we've looked at our options, um, it's important to, to, to look at the, the, the balance um, and the financials behind it. So I think that's actually really important. Um, are there any general stats about how many desks a business might reduce when offering staff a choice for hybrid working? That's possibly one for Paul or Scott. Um, are you able to help Andrea with any general stats about, you know, occupancy for, for offices? Uh, I can say that, uh, you know, they were saying on a what I call collaborative desk, uh, they expect one desk for four users. Um, they're going in. Uh, they do anticipate the desk will be height adjustable in one way or another, whether it's crank or electric, preferably electrical. Uh, uh, and uh, the the desk, the workstation, will not be allowed to be personalised. Okay, so so one one to four. I mean, it is it it, it it's quite an open one, that isn't it? Because it depends on the, the the culture of the organisation and the tasks to be done. But that's interesting. Thank you, Scott. Did you want to add anything to that? You're on mute. Of course I am, right after them. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, going back to your, your entry level in terms of profiling staff is a really good way to determine exactly uh, what your your uh, number of desks needs to be. Um, if we profile it, we can, we can really determine who's going to be there full time. Uh, and with the rest of it, we can then say, how often are we asking our hybrid users to touch down or and if so, what are the tasks that they're doing in that area? So it will very much be determined based on the organization's hybrid plan, um, but profiling users is a really good way to determine that exact space. OK, thank you, Scott. Um, a couple of questions about pat testing. I think that that is, I mean, we were struggling with that a little bit before. And um, one thing I would say is we have to remember that one of the most important things about um, electrical safety is the visual check. And I think we should be ensuring that um, our home workers and our hybrid workers um, are responsible for visually checking, checking their leads. You know, when we all, you know, plug our things in, you know, have a quick look at the, the cablings and plugs. Um, so I think there is, there's a, a lot we can do with the visual checks. Um, there are services that will go out and do pat testing um, in people's homes. In fact, we, we do that too. Um, but a lot of employers actually encourage people every so often to have pat testing days. And that's an example of time when people would come into the office and bring their electrical equipment. So it is important we look after electrical safety, but I think it really depends on the um, on how your, your staff are going to work. Um, but I, I do think that, that people should do visual testing themselves. We should all be responsible for the safety of our, our kit. Um, Andrew, I think we've did, we, we have um, covered that. Yes, we, we are able to help with um, ethical disposal. So if that's something that, that you, you need us to, to help you with, please reach out to us. Let me have a look. Um, that was a good comment. I'm glad that you've been chatting about various things as we've been going through. So that is good. Um, Tracy, you raised an interesting uh, point about accessibility for some of this collaborative equipment. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's really important that, that we make sure that uh, multi-user spaces are accessible um, um, for, for all staff um, and that needs to be taken into account. I think there is going to be a lot more room actually in collaborative spaces, so that should help the flexibility of that too. And... With the changes in furnishing styles, do I foresee an issue? Do we see office signs indicating length of use to mitigate um, muscular skeletal disorders? Yes, I think actually um, I, I would encourage, um, certainly as we're in the transition, that as part of the training, we, we remind people of what areas should be used and when it's appropriate to use a more relaxed seating um, and when they should be using um, more traditional setups. So yes, I think certainly if you're inputting into uh, information into a computer, you really need to use a proper um, setup workstation to give you support. Um, if, however, you are reading a document, perhaps you could be a more relaxed style. So yes, I think you're you're right, um, Jane, that we'll be using some guidance. 
Scott, did you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, I think there, there's always been a real challenge between the design and the function when it comes to uh, equipment suitable for end users. There's always been some highly unergonomic equipment that is um, often put forward as being suitable for an office environment. I think what it really does is it drives home the need for consultancy um, at, during the selection process to make sure that anything that is implemented is suitable not only for the way people work, but for the individuals using it as well. Yes, thank you, Scott. Right, I think last question here from, from Phil, saying that um, some of the advice, the HSC advice might be a bit vague on home workers. Yes, I, I would agree on, on the guidance. I think the important thing is to go back to the, the, the main um, regulations um, that and the, the basic premise of getting the person set up and supported in the right position. And I think if you go back to that, that gives us very good guidance as to the positions we should be um, adopting when we are doing inputting. So um, I think, um, you know, I, I hope, you know, I think I think the guidance, yes, has, has you know, that certainly needs to be updated because it is, it is, you know, it came out 30 years ago, didn't it? Um, but I do think that if we go back to the premise of getting people working in a good supported position, then actually we won't go too far wrong. Um, but again, if you'd like to reach out and talk to me about that, then that'd be fine. Now, thank you all for um, bearing with us today. I hope there's been some useful information um, within the within the session today. Please reach out to any to any of us, myself or our other speakers, if you have any specific questions. And we will be in contact next week. We are um, producing a hybrid uh, service brochure for you to provide some of the information we've got here. And as I say, I'm trying to get out a, a sample, thought-provoking um, hybrid policy that maybe you'll find useful. So thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of a sunny Friday afternoon. And thank you to, to my colleagues for taking the time and working with me on this presentation. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks.